focus on headline. All right, let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, joining us in the studio, we have our reporters, Han Dan and Chen Song Cho. Guys, welcome back. Good, Good evening. evening. All right, uh, we're going to start things off with the latest uh, export figures here. Korea continues to suffer a trade deficit now, this time for the fourth consecutive month. Uh, of course, amid the soaring energy prices, as always. Uh, Tan, first and foremost, can you break down the numbers for us? Right. Korea's exports rose 9.4% on year on solid demand for chips and the country's key export items. But the trade deficit was extended for the fourth straight month as imports jumped nearly 22 percent on year. This marks the first time Korea suffered trade deficits for four consecutive months since the 2008 global financial crisis. According to the trade ministry, outbound shipments stood at 60.7 billion U.S. dollars last month, up from 55.5 billion dollars a year earlier the highest tally for any July since the ministry began compiling related data. This on strong sales of semiconductors, which went up over 2% on year, and petroleum products, which logged a whopping 86.5% increase in July, leading the overall export growth. Exports of vehicles and rechargeable batteries also enjoyed relatively high sales growth, posting around 25% and 12% export growth, respectively. By export regions, Korea posted the largest monthly export volume to the U.S. and India on record and logged the largest volume to the ASEAN and the EU member nations for the month of July. Exports to China, however, decreased by 2.5%. But Korea posted a trade deficit deficit of $4.67 billion last month as imports jumped 21.8% on year to nearly $65.4 billion on soaring global energy prices. South Korea depends on imports for most of its energy needs, and the country's energy imports surged over 90% on year to $18.5 billion in July. Imports have exceeded exports in South Korea since April, with the deficit growing from $2.48 billion in April and around $1.6 billion in May and to $2.57 billion in June. I mean, it's a whole bunch of what ifs, right? Uh, what if uh, the global energy prices weren't surging, weren't soaring, right? And uh, in that case, South Korea would have uh, seen some record high trade uh, surplus figures here. But uh, I mean, this is what we're going through at this time. Uh, also, not surprising to see that the export numbers to China have been decreasing, I think, over uh, the past uh, few years now, since 2018, the data that I've seen, uh, the, the export numbers have been decreasing every year, uh, while the export numbers to the U.S. has been increasing, uh, I guess, uh, substantially uh, over the past few years as well. A lot of people have been citing the trade war between the United States and China for that. Uh, let's talk about a very interesting piece of news here. Children here in South Korea may be able to enter elementary school a year earlier, starting as early as 2025 here, uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Education Park Sun-hye making this proposal on Friday to President Yoon suk yeol to lower the entry age for elementary school from to five years from the current six years old. Uh, Sung-cho, tell us more about this. Right. Very interesting piece of news, yeah. isn't it? So on Friday, the Education Ministry reported this year's key policy plans to President Yoon. And amongst the plans was the proposal to lower the age to five from six. The ministry said it will soon begin full-fledged discussions. Now, Park's proposal also included a number of other plans, such as to abolish foreign language high schools while maintaining autonomous private high schools and to integrate kindergartens and child care centers, which are now separately supervised by the education and health ministries, respectively. But uh, the change of school starting age most caught the attention, obviously, and immediately triggered a debate among teachers, parents, and civic groups in the country because this is the first move in 76 years to lower the age at which children are admitted to elementary school. You know, this was not a topic that we often discussed. No. Plus, it wasn't even included in Yoon's campaign pledges. So some people are saying and wondering, where did this come from? Uh, but anyways, uh, for those who don't know, currently children in Korea are admitted to elementary school in the year they turn seven. So eight in Korean age. 
uh, and it could be as early as six, uh, depending on uh, what birthday, what month of the year right, uh, right. the kids uh, were born. So once they enter elementary school, they spend six years in elementary school, three years each in middle school and high school, and four years in university. So, uh, and then the nine years of elementary and middle school are uh, mandatory. Now, according to a deputy presidential spokesperson during a press briefing, President Yoon has given his nod to the proposal and ordered Park to start working on it as soon as possible to quickly come up with follow-up measures to lower the age while maintaining the 12-year school system from elementary to high school. The change, if confirmed, would be administered in stages from 2025 over a period of four years. And now this is due to limitations in the supply of teachers and school space. So they want a gradual change um, instead of an immediate change. So under the government plan, children born in January to March among those aged five will be eligible to enter elementary school in 2025. Then children born in January to June among those aged five will enter the elementary school in 2026 and those born in January to September in 2027, while all children aged five will enter the elementary school in 2028. Park said the ministry understands the change will bring an enormous confusion to some people, so it will fully listen to the opinions of school officials, education experts, and parents. Yeah, uh, co- confusion is an understatement because uh, right before the show, uh, Tan, Sung Cho, and I, uh, we were kind of sitting around talking about this and uh, we're trying to still calculate. And in fact, mm. I was also trying to do the calculation with my son because, uh, number one, it's confusing because I- I'm still not used to the fact that there's the uh, the Korean age and mm-hmm. the, the Western age right. or whatever your real birthday is, right? Um, but uh, I'm trying. To, we were trying. My wife and I earlier today we were trying to figure out whether my son uh, meets that cutoff line. He's he's three years old right now, and he was born in March. Uh, but let's talk about uh, why the government wants to go through the trouble of changing the system in the first place. Uh, Songcho, you have a kind of a run through on that, right? So according to Education Minister Park, the plan would reduce social and educational gap between the rich and poor families as it can reduce the burden of education expenses on parents. Now, uh, Park believes the sooner the children receive public education, the better, because right now it's up to the parents to provide education for their kids until the age, the Korean age of seven. Um, Before elementary school, parents have the option of sending their kids to either public or private nurseries, daycare centers, and kindergartens, which can sometimes show a huge gap in quality of education services they provide. Uh, This results in children learning on an uneven field from the very start, and lowering the school entering age will help reduce and protect even the kids of marginalized families under the shield of public education. Now, while saying changing the school admission age is not a solution to the country's rapidly declining birth rate and aging population, Minister Park said it could help tackle the labor force shortages. Uh, The labor force right now is shrinking because of the country's fertility rate is so low now. And if children are allowed to complete their education and begin working earlier after graduating from college, uh, it will help expand the labor force. And also, if we look at other countries like the UK and Ireland, they enroll four-year-olds in primary school as well. Plus, the government will only green light the plan with enough preparations and if it gained consensus public support. So the education ministry will form and start operating a task force on school system reform in August this year and also uh, launch a survey involving 20,000 students and parents in September to gather opinions on the matter. Now, if they reach a social consensus, then school admission will be gradually expanded to five-year-old children starting 2025. The ministry will devise a draft plan as well to change the schooling system in the second half of this year before the National Education Committee will start discussing the final execution plan for a new system from next year. So the education ministry believes that it can have enough public feedback on its plan by the end of this year and would devise measures to expand childcare and other support 
support before launching a pilot program. Yeah, I mean, if they're going to find out and try to gather as much public opinion as uh, possible, I mean, they've probably gotten a, a lot of naysayers so far. There's been uh, a lot of very upset parents in regards to this. There's been a lot of upset teachers. Uh, protests in regards- already. Yeah, yeah, the pro- protests. Mm. And, and uh, if my son was old enough to understand what's going on, he'd probably be protesting because uh, he, he's certainly enjoying his daycare days right now uh, with all those animals and bugs that he gets to touch at daycare. Uh, Tan, I want to ask you this question because you are a parent. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have a child who I believe just recently went to That's right. uh, first grade as well. So I, let's, let's get the mom perspective, the parent perspective on this uh, latest first grade age assessment. So as a mom of a daughter who just went through the first grade last year, my biggest concern is whether seven-year-olds, Korean age, will be able to cope with the school system that's vastly different from kindergartens at such a young age. Some moms are even making jokes that they might have to, you know, drop off their kids to school in in strollers now. Hmm. Uh, What adults often overlook is the immense difference between the ambience and the curriculum of a kindergarten or a play school and an elementary school. In Korea, strict rules and discipline begin to be applied ever since entering an elementary school from the first grade. So stress levels among first graders are known to be particularly high because of the vastly different atmosphere. Another thing that adults often forget is how big a one-year difference is among young children. Within a year, some children can go from speaking only the simple words to fluently reading several paragraphs. So some might wonder what all the fuss is about lowering just one year to enter school, right? But for kids at that age, One year means a period of physical and mental developments beyond what most adults can imagine. I understand where the government is coming from, though. Uh, Sangcho, you brushed, uh, you you mentioned that the government's uh, aim, uh, part of its aim is to provide cheaper and fair public education at earlier ages. Uh, And uh, its strategy is also, it's part of their efforts to tackle the worsening problem of an aging population. But according to recent reports, In 26 out of 38 OECD member nations, children enter elementary school at the age of 8, Korean age. Perhaps Korea can look into other ways to tackle the aging population and shrinking workforce in those 26 countries, rather than hastily reintroducing the system that had not been in place for the past seven decades. You know, uh, something that was, again, my wife and I had this uh, long talk today uh, in regards to this, and uh, we never talk current affairs, my wife and I. (laughs) Never. Whatever's on the news, we never talk about. I don't watch news when I go back home. Mm. Uh, I get so tired of maintain peace. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. My my wife is far from uh, involved with current affairs or news or anything like that. But she brought up up this topic, and it was a, a pleasant surprise. Uh, One of the things that she was concerned about was, uh, you know, they were saying that if you go to elementary school earlier than, uh, you know, they mentioned the whole, uh, the the equality thing where you don't have to put into the the fairness, the, 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 what is it, the, the, the gap, the weight, what what gap was it, the the financial gap? The education gap. Yeah, education gap. The rich and the poor. Yeah, but then the thing is, what's going to happen, what she's concerned about is as soon as, you know, here in Korea, as soon as they go into elementary school is when they start sending them to like these cram schools. Uh, mm-hmm. these private institutions and private mm-hmm. academies. And so these kids, yeah, sure, um, they might not have to you know, pay for the daycare per se, which, by the way, the government basically pays like half of it in mm-hmm. the first place. Mm-hmm. It's not that much. Uh, but now a lot of these kids are going to have to go start going to these cram school at an year- earlier age. Mm, right. uh, the Another concern that my wife especially had is the fact that because my son was born in March, he, he's in that cutoff line, right? <laughs> and so because he was born in that January to March gap, he's going to go to uh, first grade with kids who were born the year before. Right. But the, you know, the latter half, right? What is it mm-hmm. from like April to w- whatever? Uh, the big problem with this is what we've seen uh, even in daycare center is like, there was this one kid, like good friend of uh, my son at daycare. Uh, he was born in February, big kid. Uh, they put him in uh, class higher, mm-hmm. a level higher. Mm-hmm. 
And so these, he was basically going to daycare with kids that were a year older than him. Right. Uh, they basically said, you are a baby. You cannot hang with us. Uh, we're not going to play with you. And they pushed him around uh, and bullied him around. And uh, that parent, uh, the parents of that kid basically had to move schools oh. and begged the uh, the head of the daycare to put mm-hmm. him in with uh, the 2019 kids that were born in 2019. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's what my wife is now concerned about. Uh, mm-hmm. what, what happens when you go to a school at a, you know with kids that are uh, basically a year older? Mm-hmm. Uh, how are they going to be treated? Is the big thing so? And the amount of information they absorb, yeah, yeah, during that one year, it's it's so huge. Yeah. The difference is so huge. Yeah, it really is. And I, I really, th- I, I don't remember how first grade. I know actually, I do remember first grade. Like I, there was some studying. Uh, there was a lot of board game playing. But uh, I mean, I went to public school in New York City, which doesn't say much. Right, you um, went to a school in the U.S., right? Right, but I remember when I first entered the elementary school when I was in the first grade. The the ambience, the the environment, it was so strict. Mm. I was so scared, yeah. like little me. I was so scared because that's what uh, that's what things are still like in Korea. You are subject to a very strict discipline. Mm-hmm. Ever since the first grade. Yeah, and and I really like the whole idea of sending my kid, you know, to daycare because I mean he's not really learning, you know, like he's not doing any studying per se. Like he's doing a lot of ex- uh, exploration. He's learning new things. He's discovering new things. Uh, I mean, I think that's a big part of growing up before you end up going to uh, elementary school. But. Uh, I, I, there are so many parents right now uh, who are very concerned with this. And uh, again, uh, I'm watching this very carefully because my son happens to, you know, meet that cutoff line here. Uh, my other thing is now what happens to his Little League uh, baseball eligibility age? Can I send him to Little League baseball earlier uh, through this is the other question that I have. But uh, we'll see. Again, uh, the government said that they'll be getting more, uh, I guess, opinions from the public uh, before they, I guess, uh, pull the trigger on this one. Uh, guys, let's move on. To the latest on COVID-19 here uh, today, things were a bit different for COVID-19 patients in the high-risk group. The daily phone uh, health monitoring service provided for them by the government has been stopped. Uh, Don, what is this all about? Right. The daily phone monitoring for COVID patients in the high-risk group, including the elderly aged 60 and older and those with weak immune systems, is no longer in service. According to the government, under the adjusted home treatment system that went into effect from today, August 1st, right? Yes. (laughs) The classifications of high-risk and low-risk groups have been scrapped, and all people with COVID symptoms are equally recommended to visit nearby clinics. Up until now, those in the high-risk group were subject to the daily phone monitoring service during their mandatory quarantine period. The government aims to prevent patients from developing severe symptoms through more prompt and accurate in-person medical consultations. It's also quite confident that expanded COVID treatment facilities and edible treatment will help significantly in lowering the number of critically ill patients. Currently, there are more than 8,770 so-called one-stop COVID clinics and 4,400 respiratory clinics nationwide. But there are concerns over the scrapping of the daily monitoring service as it could also raise risks among amid rising numbers of severe cases. Around 4.5% of nearly 500,000 patients being treated at home were classified as the high-risk group subject to the phone checks. And some point out that those in the high-risk group may not be able to visit COVID clinics in cases of emergency. Uh, But the 24-hour medical consultation service will remain open. Also from today, the fourth round of COVID shots began to be administered for those aged 50 and older and 18 and older with underlying illnesses or weak immune systems who made pre-reservations. From tomorrow, even those without symptoms can get a quick antigen test for just 5,001 at nearby clinics if they came in close contact with a confirmed patient. Previously, they had to pay 50,001 if they were asymptomatic. 50,000? Oh my Mm. goodness, I had no idea it was that expensive. Uh, The doubling phenomenon that we've been talking about, uh, it's actually been slowing down with cases falling below the 45,000 range, Uh, but it is a Monday figure, uh, which means we'll generally see lower numbers because of the lack of testing over the weekend. But uh, Talon, 
let's also see numbers in regards to that. Right. We saw daily figures double from week to week, but that trend has slowed down from last week. Korea posted roughly 44,690 daily new COVID cases today, down by 28,900 from the previous record. Imported cases, however, continue to rise, adding 436, up by 95 from the day before. Amid eased border restrictions and the summer vacation season, overseas transmissions continued to hover around the three to 400 range. Daily infections appear to have hit a plateau, but due to a lag of about a week or two, the number of severe cases are continuing to show the doubling trend. Korea saw nearly 290 severe cases today, hitting the highest level in 75 days. The number is nearly four times higher than a month ago. 21 people died of COVID overnight. You know, I had a chance to talk to a couple of people who recently had the uh, the Omicron variant, uh, the, what is it, the BA5. Mm. Uh, you know, the consensus was that, like, the symptoms weren't as bad as, like, uh, previous Omicrons or whatever. They said they don't know what they're talking about because they had it really, really bad. Uh, so we still have to be very careful here. Uh, not to mention, I think, uh, what is that, that, that side concert that was uh, going on everywhere, right. the water show? Mm-hmm. And the water bomb festival yeah, in Seoul I mean, that was held Yeah, that, that apparently led to major infection cases. Like 2,000, over 2,000 cases just yeah. in Kangwondo province. Yeah, that's only in Kangwondo province. Mm-hmm. Like the one in Seoul was like tens of thousands is, is, is what people are saying. So uh, we still have to be very careful here. Uh, President Yoon will be going on summer vacation starting from today uh, all the way to Friday. Now, it is uh, peak vacation season but where's his destination well it's my kind of vacation it's his home uh he's decided not to travel to provincial regions uh unlike what some of his uh, predecessors did for holidays instead remain in seoul to rest and refresh his mind so let's get the the detailed plans of his vacation right so uh, if you look at former president's vacation destinations they often visited the island of Cheodo near Goje island in Gyeongsangnam-do province for presidential retreats but um, i think uh, it was president yoon's very well calculated decision just to stay home because his approval ratings have been unusually low i mean even below 30% in some surveys i read from uh, a number from the korea society opinion institute survey the the number was 28.9%. And this is for a president less than three months in office. And the economy is still struggling while COVID-19 is resurging. Plus, we have to talk about the leadership turmoil, yeah. right? It's deepening at the ruling People Power Party. Um, I think you probably talked about this on the show, an embarrassing text conversation last week he had with PPP floor leader Kwon Song dong It was caught on camera uh, and actually Kwon stepped down as acting uh, chairman of the People uh, Power Party to take responsibility for the leadership crisis within the party. And three members of the party's Supreme Council stepped down, meaning the majority of their Supreme Council members' positions are vacant. And actually the party did decided to shift to a collective leadership system, uh, quote-unquote, emergency committee system today. So we'll have to see what's going to happen yeah. in the following days. But the president just is not in a situation where he can spend his vacation relaxed at a vacation retreat. Um, according to what officials at the ruling party and the presidential office said Monday during his five-day leave, while staying at home, Yoon is expected to listen to opinions from people from various circles, to look back on the past two months and come up with plans to navigate the current economic and political turmoil. But still, you may pay surprise visits to local areas for two to three days during the holiday. Before leaving for vacation, Yoon instructed aides to make sure to deal thoroughly with the resurgence of COVID-19 infections, ensure public safety during vacation, and try to allay concerns about surging prices ahead of the Chuseok fall harvest holiday. Oh boy, that Chuseok holiday that's coming up shortly, right? Uh, In about a little more than a month now, the the inflation, how that's going to affect Chuseok holiday, uh, that's going to be major. Uh, Another top-level defense meeting between South Korea and the United States took place over in Washington over the weekend. Uh, defense chiefs of both countries agreeing to expand the joint military exercise and to resume high-level dialogue on extended deterrence 
Songshu, let's also get the rundown of the meeting here. Yes, according to a press release by Seoul's Defense Ministry at the meeting on Friday, South Korean Defense Minister Lee jong sop and U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin agreed to combine their country's joint military exercise in the latter half of 2022 with the Ulji civil contingency exercise uh, that is scheduled to take place in late August until early September. They also agreed to continue strengthening the Allies' deterrence posture, which includes the ballistic missile defense system and U.S. strategic assets deployed on the Korean peninsula. Their agreement came a day after Pyongyang state media carried a speech by North Korean leader Kim Jong-un blasting Washington for its planned joint exercise with Seoul. Nevertheless, the two defense chiefs agreed the security condition on the Korean peninsula was very serious due to North Korea's continued provocations and also agreed to resume high-level Extended Deterrence Strategy and Consultation Group, EDSCG for short, uh, to boost their combined deterrence. Now, this talks involves consultations between U.S. and South Korean diplomatic and military representatives on strategic and policy issues regarding extended deterrence against North Korea, including how to better leverage the full breadth of the power of the two countries, including diplomacy, information, military, and economic capabilities. Besides the EDSCG and the military exercises, measures to bolster readiness to the security threat posed by North Korea include a combined missile detection and tracking exercise by the United States, South Korea, Japan, Canada, and Australia named Pacific Dragon, which will begin on Monday in Hawaii and last until August 14th. South Korea plans to send eight surface vessels and two aircraft, including the 7,600-ton Aegis destroyer King's Hejong the Great, to participate in the drill. That's right. And uh, other, we have this uh, large-scale joint military exercise drill that we just talked about here off the coast of Hawaii. First two weeks of August, beginning on Monday. It is now, I believe, uh, Monday in Hawaii time there. Uh, Tan, let's talk a little bit more about this exercise that the uh, Pacific Dragon. Right. It's the uh, biannual joint ballistic missile defense exercise dubbed the Pacific Dragon, conducted by South Korea, U.S. and Japan, and often plus some others led by the U.S. The South Korean military says the drills led by the U.S. Pacific Fleet Command will be held between August 1st and the 14th off the coast of Hawaii by the navies of South Korea, U.S., Japan, plus Australia and Canada to enhance missile detection and information sharing capability against North Korea's missile threats. Uh, like Sancho said, 1,600 tons Hejong the Great Class Aegis destroyer equipped with SM-2 surface-to-air missile will be dispatched to the drills in which the five countries will practice detecting, tracking, and sharing information on dummy ballistic projectiles fired by the U.S. Navy. The U.S. Navy will also conduct intercepting maneuvers of the dummy projectiles with guided missiles. The Pacific Dragon has been held biannually, but it was not announced to the public in 2018 and 2020 in consideration of inter-Korean relations. But the South Korean military explained that public disclosure of the drills were deemed necessary this year amid rising North Korea threats. The drills follow a Seoul-Washington-Tokyo trilateral defense ministers meeting in Singapore held in June, where the three sides agreed to hold ballistic uh, missile defense drills on a regular basis to counter North Korea's rising nuclear and missile threats. Yeah, not to mention, I think uh, over the weekend I saw the news, uh, Kim Jong-un, really, really big threat threats against Seoul. Uh, Things are pretty tense right now in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, We'll see whether or not this is going to be the latest uh, military drills between the three countries going to be met with some provocations by the North uh, moving forward here. Uh, Another thing to look forward to, U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi arriving in Singapore earlier today. Uh, This kicks off her uh, tour of Asia. Uh, But the big question, right, is this possible stopover in Taiwan, which is going to cause major tensions uh, with Beijing. So, uh, Song Shou, tell us more about this. Yes, actually, there's no media access to her visit, uh, which has been kept under tight wraps. But a person familiar with the matter confirmed that Pelosi and her delegation landed in Singapore before dawn today. They spoke on condition of anonymity because they were not authorized to release details to the media. According to a spokesperson for Singapore's foreign ministry, 
ministry, she was set to call Singapore President Halima Yaakob and Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong. She was also expected to attend a cocktail reception with the American Chamber of Commerce in Singapore. Now, in a statement over the weekend, uh, Pelosi said she will also visit Malaysia, South Korea, and Japan to discuss trade, the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, security, and democratic governance. But now, yes, the question is, what about Taiwan, right? She left Taiwan out of the itinerary in a statement on Sunday announcing the trip and didn't confirm news reports that she might visit Taiwan, which is claimed by Beijing as its own territory. Chinese President Xi Jinping warned against meddling in Beijing's dealings with the island in a phone call last week with his American counterpart Joe Biden. Yet, speculation is still rife that Pelosi would visit Taiwan at some point this week, risking a heavy-handed response from China. The Biden administration has tried to assure Beijing there was no reason to come to blows and that if such a visit occurred, it would signal no change in U.S. policy. Now, to give you more information about Pelosi's trip to Korea, uh, she will meet with National Assembly Speaker Kim Jin-pyo later this week on Thursday to discuss regional security, economic cooperation, and other pending issues. After the meeting set for Thursday morning, the two speakers will hold a joint press conference before having lunch together. Yeah, at least this meeting isn't going to uh, cause any problems with China, hopefully. (laughs) But uh, yeah, the Taiwan trip, oh man, we're going to watch that very carefully. Uh, Some relief on the horizon as Ukraine's grain exports have resumed today, following the grain export deal signed by Ukraine, Russia, UN, and Turkey. Uh, Tan, this marks the first move, first in more than five months since uh, Russia began that invasion on Ukraine back in February. Let's, let's get the latest on this. Sure. Amid high hopes, the Defense Ministry of Turkey has confirmed that the first outbound shipment of grains from Ukraine departed the Odessa port in southern Ukraine during the morning hours of Monday local time. It said the Sierra Leone flagged vessel named Radzoni carrying 26,000 tons of corn departed from Black Sea port of Odessa for Lebanon. This follows the grain export deal brokered by the UN and Turkey, which will allow release of large stores of Ukrainian crops to foreign markets and ease a growing hunger crisis. The ship is expected to reach Istanbul on Tuesday, where it'll be inspected before being allowed to proceed. Lebanon uh, is now in the grips of what the World Bank has described as one of the world's worst financial crises in more than 150 years. The Turkish ministry statement said other ships would also depart Ukraine's ports through the safe corridors in line with the deal signed in Istanbul on July 22nd, but did not provide further details. Ukraine, as you know, is a major grain exporter, last year supplying 11% of the world's wheat exports, 12% of corn exports, and 43% of sunflower oil exports. Uh, Since Russia invaded Ukraine in February, a naval blockade has prevented Ukraine from shipping grain out of its southern ports. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has said although the volume of grain production is expected to be half of the annual average, the country's goal is to stop the global food crisis triggered by the Russian invasion. Uh, But Russia's shelling continued, killing the owner of one of Ukraine's largest agricultural companies, Nibulon, on Sunday. Alexei Varatursky and his wife were killed in their home in southern city of uh, Mykolaiv during shelling that hit several targets, including schools. Uh, I mean, it's just the more news that we get from Ukraine, it just gets uh, gloomier and gloomier. But uh, I'm glad to see that the the exports of the grains have resumed because uh, I believe it was like last week when they had signed that there was a... Some attacks in the uh, the Black Sea ports, uh, which Ukraine said would happen uh, despite the agreement put in place by uh, Russia. But uh, as if all these shellings were far from enough, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin announcing that the Russian Navy will be receiving uh, what's called the Zircon hypersonic missiles within months here. So, Tana, what, what is he talking about this time? S.J. Putin made the claim during a Navy Day parade in his home city of St. Petersburg. The president said the Zircon cruise missiles would be deployed in the upcoming months and said it would allow the Russian Navy to quickly engage with threats 
He added, the key thing here is the capability of the Russian Navy. It is able to respond with lightning speed to all who decide to infringe on our sovereignty and freedom. Now, the delivery of those missiles to the Russian armed forces is expected to start in the coming months. Russia first tested the Zircon in uh, January 2020 and claimed it could reach speeds upwards of Mach 8 or 9,800 kilometers per hour and strike targets within a range of 1,000 kilometers. Although Russia's claims haven't been verified, it's known that such speed is unintersceptable with existing missile defense systems. Yeah, and uh, right before this announcement, I believe uh, Putin signed like a 55-page defense doctrine, like the naval defense doctrine or something, where it listed like all the enemies of uh, Russia and basically said that the United States has been uh, illegally taking over the world's oceans. Uh, Also mentioned NATO for uh, basically closing on uh, Russia's, closing on close to uh, Russia's borders. And so basically his mention of the Zircon cruise missile is not only targeted to Ukraine, which, by the way, he didn't mention anything about Ukraine Mm. uh, during his speech, but uh, they're saying uh, this uh, Zircon cruise missile, uh, hypersonic cruise missile could be targeted towards who Putin claims has enemies, uh, the United States, NATO, and uh, Ukraine. Uh, Putin, Putin mentioned that uh, these mis- the deployment of these missiles will depend on Russia's national interests. Y- yeah, right. So what does that mean, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, very quickly, before we wrap things up, uh, Don Pack uh, wrote something on our live YouTube that uh, got me confused even more regarding the the. the what is it, the, the first grade entry, entrance? Mm. So he says the seven and eight-year-old kids... Uh, who, who basically turned seven and eight in 2025. Right. Well, they'd be going first grade with the five-year-olds is what he's asking. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> we don't know. According to Song Cho's report, the actual introduction, the full introduction right. will begin from 2028, right? 2028. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Like, there's like, a, I guess it's intervals. A mercy period. A mercy period. Sort of like a mercy period. Grace, grace period, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, there's a lot of, I mean, again, it's only been mentioned since uh, last Friday. So once they start clearing things up, uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Tan and Song Cho, thank you very much for your report and your insights on some of these issues. Stay safe, and uh, we'll see you guys again. Thank you. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.